Yes, hi. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation <clears throat> uh, of this uh, very extensive and uh, deeply researched report. My name is Jan Strofczewski. I'm the Deputy Bureau Chief for Reuters in Brussels, and I deal mainly with uh, economic issues. <clears throat> I will have the pleasure to moderate uh, the discussion of this report. Uh, and with us, we have today a very distinguished panel, two members of the European Parliament, Mr. Markus Ferber and Mr. Paul Tang, and uh, two excellent economists from the EU Tax Observatory itself. You've heard both of them speak, Mr. Elwa Flema and Mrs. Aragodar, but they'll be available to answer some questions as well. Let me very briefly uh, introduce uh, each each of them. Mr. Ferber is the vice chair of the European Parliament's Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, and also the vice president of the tax subcommittee. <clears throat> so he, he knows uh, all there is to know about taxes. Uh, and as a member of the Bavarian CSU, he belongs to the, Europeans, the European People's Party. So the center right. Mr. Tang, on the other hand, uh, is on the center left. He's a member of the Socialists and Democrats political family in the European Parliament. And he also specializes in economic and monetary affairs. And he's the chair of the subcommittee on taxation. Um, Mr. Flamand, is, whom you uh, just heard present the report, um, is an expert in special tax schemes and how they're used for tax competition. And Mrs. Godard is uh, developing a public data repository for the EU Tax Observatory uh, that will be used on the website for researchers, journalists, and policymakers. So we're in a company of, of experts here. Uh, and uh, myself, I'm not an expert on tax, but that's uh, perhaps good <laughs> because I'll ask all kinds of stupid questions. Um, um, the first one that uh, struck me uh, when I read the report and saw the presentation is, is that it mentions um, as distortive or therefore negative various tax schemes that favor um, either corporate research and development or intellectual property patents, uh, sometimes directly scientists, like in Italy, <clears throat> etc. Uh, and it would seem that this is in line with um, with what the European Union has as a policy goal, namely to create a knowledge-based economy, improve global position and patterns, and generally innovate and, uh, um, and invest in research. So given that tax schemes are usually the, the best, one of the best tools governments have to influence the development of various sectors, how should one how, how should the EU uh, as, as a whole, EU institutions and governments reconcile the two, the distortive effect of preferential tax schemes and yet the, the need to, to um, help certain uh, sectors along to develop research and development, etc. Maybe I can address that first to the two uh, members of parliament and then maybe Sarah could, could add a few words. Uh, Mr. Ferber, uh, why don't you start? Yeah, thank you very much, Jan, and thank you very much for being invited to this uh, very distinguished uh, panel. And uh, thanks at the beginning to the Tax Observatory for the research they have done, which puts a lot of spotlights uh, to problems we are confronted with uh, inside the European Union. And that is really well appreciated, uh, to say it very clear. But Jan, coming to your question, as a general line, I would uh, suggest that we look at the issue of tax incentives for research and development, not only under the lens of aggressive tax planning and tax avoidance, because you mentioned as well, there's a political goal uh, behind the curtain, which we want to achieve as well. Research and development are desirable. They foster innovation, they create wealth, and they have positive spillovers. In times when we have ambitious policy goals, in relation, of course, of digitalization and the Green Deal, we need innovation and technologies. Overall, we rather have too little research and development in the EU than too much. I don't know who has the micro on additionally, because I don't see that. 
Uh, though there's a point in thinking about how we can encourage more research and development, tax incentives are one way to do just that. Often they are a little easier to obtain and to implement than providing research grants that come with a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of uncertainty for the applicants. If you look at um, the main complaints on Horizon 2020 or Horizon Europe now, that is really bureaucracy. That's the other way of granting the company's uh, money for research and development. With a smartly designed tax incentive, on the other hand, companies know what they will get. Having said that, in practice, though, we have to acknowledge that not all tax incentives are created equal and that not all tax incentives actually contribute to boosting research and development to creating value. You mentioned, for example, patent boxes where I see little evidence that they actually encourage research and development or that they can contribute to a value creation. So we have to look in the, into the details. From a single market perspective, what we really need would be very clear guidance, which kind of tax incentives for research and development are compatible with the single market and which ones are not. And of course, that could be a prime job for the commission or the code of conduct group uh, to develop these guidelines. One possibility would be to look very carefully which kind of tax incentives is linked to tangible costs uh, that actually occurred. By that I mean not some vague artificial accounting costs that are li linked to royalties for some dodgy intellectual property, but real money being spent for real research and development. The more radical approach would be to stop supporting research via tax, breaks altogether and to go for an old fashioned subsidy instead. Economically, a tax break and a subsidy of the same amount are essentially the same. But when it comes to the budget negotiations, normally tax incentives are easier to justify than subsidies. And I spoke about the bureaucratic burden as well. So to sum up uh, a long story, I think um, a clear guidance in relation to tax incentives for research and development coming from the European Union, maybe Code of Conduct Group, maybe a European Commission, would be very useful that at the end we do not see disturption of the single market. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Herbert. Uh, Mr. Tang, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you also for this, uh, for this invitation and uh, for the opportunity to discuss this report. Um, I very much like to see the work of the EU Tax Observatory bring um, knowledge and insights to, to policymakers and help us to structure the debate and this gives a broad overview of what is going on uh, under the heading of tax competition. Let me first make a general remark on the word tax competition because it gives competition a bad name, right? Uh, <laughs> this is uh, what we see in the report are forms of rent seeking. And I've been trained as an economist and a huge fan of uh, football. So competition is, is not a bad, necessarily a bad thing, but a competition, I think you need equal access for everyone, a level playing field, forcing everyone to make the best of it, right? That's the good thing about competition. Well, we don't see this in uh, in tax competition at all. There's, uh, it's very clearly unequal access, not everyone can do it, and it leads, and it's more a form of redistribution than promoting real activities. That That's the whole problem with tax competition. So. Uh, I don't see this as uh, the tax competition we would like. But interesting is then to turn to R&D or more generally to investment. What we see in Europe uh, is maybe perhaps a lack of R&D, of a lack of investment in general, and also of R&D investment. Whereas we know that the external, the externalities are huge. So the, the, the social return is much higher than the private return in R&D. And many member states uh, act accordingly. Uh, but I would like to make a distinction between uh, promoting R&D through subsidies and through tax incentives. Um, this goes back to research I had done before I entered politics. It also formed the base of, uh, I think, Dutch policy for, for some time. Be careful what you research. You may, you may, you may have impact, right? Um, and there we... Uh, we look at that, those days we very much looked also at the subsidy schemes in the Netherlands, uh, saying that they work rather efficient, apart from of always the bureaucracy we have, that's true, 
um, but it promoted indeed spending on R&D. And most importantly, I would say it promoted spending on research, researchers and laboratories. So it indeed led to addition of, uh, of activities. And that would always, would always, I think, also is very important for the spillovers because spillovers are very much related to the interaction of researchers. So most of the spillovers of R&D are also limited uh, by, by distance, I think are local. Um, so yeah, subsidies are in that sense uh, effective and has the advantage over uh, tax incentives, those tax expenditures, that they are on the budget. So they are democratically discussed. Now with tax incentives, I'm a bit more uh, suspicious because first of all, it involves most of the time intellectual properties which are highly mobile and are not necessarily related to any real R&D activity. And the second reason is that uh, tax expenditures do not find uh, the same democratic scrutiny as subsidies. Um, so I think there can be said something for uh, quite given the external effects, with, given the, the gap between the social and private return for incentivizing R&D. But I'd rather have it, uh, my first step would be uh, subsidies and perhaps only in the second place, uh, the, the tax incentive. But I agree with Marcus, if this is the situation uh, and we are, uh, then we must have some guidance within the European Union to make sure that we don't end up with some harmful tax practices in the sense that it becomes rent seeking. Um, we want to differentiate between the good and the bad. Uh, but I'd rather see the guidance from the European Commission that's public, that can be discussed in, uh, in the polit political arena, code of conduct group. It's also in your recommendations. For me, that's very opaque, not subject to the democratic scrutiny. So I, again, prefer to put democracy on the first place. Uh, but to conclude, uh, I agree with Marcus that guidance for the type of um, incent uh, types of incentives given to R&D uh, are very welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, it seems we have a consensus uh, forming that uh, subsidies rather than than tax incentives and that they should, the guidance should be public and uh, made by an impartial institution like the Commission. Um, uh, Mr. Godar, what do you what, what do you think about this? Well, much has been said already, and I agree to most of what ha what has been said. I think. There are good arguments for supporting private research and development with taxpayer money, but as also Mr. Ferber pointed out, we have to make sure that the results are those that we hope to get, like uh, are the benefits of those incentives really as um, high as the cost of those incentives. And um, I think here we should definitely prefer cost-based R&D incentives rather than pattern boxes, which only reward successful R&D afterwards, but not in the early phase where it's actually research is much more costly and we have high sunk costs that companies need to, um, to finance. Um, yes, but also with R&D, we have this problem with cost-based R&D incentives. We might have this problem in the, in the European Union that countries compete against each other. And, and uh, I think a recent study by, by Knoll and Riedel and other researchers has shown that multinational corporations tend to like, due to or as a um, result of those incentives, not necessarily increase their overall research and development activity, but they relocate uh, uh, the activity across countries to benefit from the best uh, R&D incentives in, 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 in individual countries. So this might be a, um, a beneficial strategy from the point of view of those individual countries, but for the European Union as a whole, it might not make much sense. So I totally agree that a bit of harmonization um, would be needed to avoid this um, competitive competition, which in the end only costs money and then not necessarily leads to more research and development overall. And of course, I also agree that uh, that um, subsidies are a bit more transparent for the citizens and allow more scrutiny of those, um, uh, yeah, of this public financing of research and development. Yeah. So we say that 
uh, like in the report, we also acknowledge that there are some poorer countries, maybe in the European Union, which don't have enough uh, public uh, revenues to compete with rich countries' um, subsidies for research and development. So there might be a, a, a rationale for allowing some sort of R&D <laughs> tax incentives, but we think that uh, that those should be limited to some extent. Yeah. Now some countries already implement or allow for 200% of, of deduction of the cost of R&D. And, 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 and if this is not uh, stopped by the min global minimum tax, we don't know yet, this can be problematic in the long term, I think. Excellent points. Um, I, I think we have a, a takeaway uh, from, from this particular question Hi. very easily. Um, my other, my other um, uh, thought when I read the report was, was that um, <clears throat> when it comes, uh, the, there, was a, there was a suggestion there that, um, for instance, uh, when it comes to companies, um, some, uh, some governments offer um, tax incentives for financing through equity rather than through debt for companies. And, uh, uh, and I remember also that um, uh, under the EU capital market scheme, the, the EU is very keen to actually switch to financing through equity from financing through debt, which is pre prevalent in, in the EU, unlike in the United States, where companies are free to, um, uh, to borrow from other sources than banks and raise cash through equity, for instance. And so if, if this um, if this sort of tax um, um, incentive uh, for, for financing through equity is, is harmful, how, how, should, how should the EU deal with this situation? And what could be done to, to make, uh, uh, to, to provide more sources of financing for companies without creating distortive uh, tax incentives? Uh, again, maybe now we should start with Mr. Tang and then go to, uh, to Mr. Ferber. Okay, thank you. Um, well, again, you would like to differentiate good from bad, right? So um, um, we want to reduce the debt equity bias uh, for the reason that we want firms, big and small, to be resilient and have their own capital rather than rely on debt, making them more vulnerable. Besides, we want, don't want to have the situation where we have seen in the past that takeovers are he heavily debt financed. Um, putting the, the, the takeover target in jeopardy from the start. So if you take out resilience, there's a good reason to promote a bit more equity or to at least to remove the debt bias. Now, the question is how to do that. Um, and, um, I'm aware, I was aware before reading the report of the Italian and the Belgian scheme I, uh, that was be discussed also in the previous mandate of the European Parliament. Uh, so different ways of doing it. Uh, what struck me then uh, was that there are also different ways to work around uh, or to work with this uh, allowance for corporate equity schemes. So one is more vulnerable to, um, to misuse, to abuse than the other. Um, in that sense, I am um, I'm, I'm sort of open for the debates on what is the best way to remove the debt equity bias. The alternative is already there, of course, and that should also be kept in mind. If you can't find a way to uh, to come with a uh, functional ACE uh, allowance for corporate equity, just limit the the interest uh, the interest deductions as we already see in uh, in, uh, in in Europe. That's the alternative. So for me, it's a way for moving forward. And I would say that when it comes to the capital market union, I think many policy, European policy makers are in favor of a capital market union. It allows better, more own capital at uh, the balance sheet of companies, allowing more resilience, could also lead to private risk sharing and all that. But I must say the conditions for having a capital market union are far from fulfilled. We still have the debt equity by the debt bias in the corporate uh, in the corporate tax system. We don't have European supervision. Uh, for to name a, two big examples, so moving towards this capital market union seems always very difficult to me if you don't uh, fulfill the necessary conditions to go there. Uh, but okay, this is part of that this, uh, this discussion, and uh, in that sense, I would rather have to take a pragmatic approach. Of course, it shouldn't lead. 
because that's the, that's the danger also that it will lead to a reduction of the debt burden, uh, oh, sorry, of the tax burden on some of the corporates or the larger corporates. That would be an, uh, um, uh, that would be a, a distribution I would not favor, especially since we try to fight uh, tax avoidance and indeed make sure that also the big companies pay their fair share, and that would go against that. Uh, but like I said, I would rather have a pragmatic approach or pragmatic discussion on what is the best way to reduce or eliminate the debt bias in the corporate tax system. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Faber? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to discuss this issue again with Paul Tang, as I remember quite well the discussions we had on this issue when we negotiated together the CCCTB, the common consolidated corporate tax base, where we had to address the research issue, which was our uh, first uh, round of question, and now, of course, this uh, uh, bias. But uh, starting again, not looking on the tax planning perspective, but from the corporate finance perspective, when we look that way, of course, we see that there is a debt equity bias and it's a reality with real world implications. And um, so we have to look more in the depth uh, what, what does it mean for, for the economy? From a tax perspective, debt is treated much more favorable than equity. Now that leads to companies preferring debt financing to equity financing, which in turn encourages them to take on maybe too much debt, making the business more risky than it needs to be. And in a crisis, like we have seen now with uh, the COVID pandemic, they can quickly cause problems. Uh, the debt equity bias also encourages companies to pursue a single channel financing strategy. In Europe, that often means bank financing over capital markets financing, and that is arguably a problem in the context of the capital markets union. So the debt equity bias is a real and efforts to address it. And that does not automatically mean country intends to create a tax planning scheme if countries try to address it. In theory, you can address the debt equity bias via two ways, either by introducing similar deductions for equity financing as you are having for debt financing or by getting rid of the interest cost deduction. Both approaches would level the playing field. However, financing costs are real costs for businesses. This allowing the de deductibility puts those businesses in a more difficult spot. Therefore, I think the answer should be to introduce a similar mechanism for equity financing as already exists for debt financing. Obviously, such mechanisms should be compatible with, single, with the single market and should not create new distortions. In that sense, the only chance to achieve something is a European approach. That's why Paul and me discussed it on the CCCTV issue as uh, that would, be, would have been a European answer. I understand that the European Commission is working on a proposal for a debt equity bias reduction allowance, the famous DEBRA, that will be introduced as part of the BEFIT package. And I think that is a way in the right direction. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, and uh, Ms. Godard, anything to um, add? Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. Um, I mean, I think in all this debate, we should not forget that the first purpose of tax is to raise tax revenues, right? And of course, we need those revenues from any public expenditures that we want to make as a society. And I think um, the second, uh, our second uh, problem is, of course, that we want to um, distort economic behavior as least as possible with our taxes. That's, I, I agree. But at the same time, we also have to keep in mind the distributional function of the tax system. Okay, so actually we are balancing many different functions of the tax system against each other. And it's not always possible to reconcile them in one with one uh, tax reform. And I think with the, um, with the notional interest deduction, I have one doubt that is if we really care about, if it's really the debt equity bias that we care about, why don't we remove this, um, distortion but increase the general corporate tax rate at the same time okay or find another compensatory measure to, to like to compensate for the revenue that we lose with those notional interest deduction and especially in countries which allow for very high notional interest reduction uh, deductions 
by 5% even, such as uh, I think Malta and Cyprus. Um, I wonder if, 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 the, like, if the first reason to adopt this is really the preoccupation about the distortive effects, or if this measure is not also used to just reduce the general level of corporate taxation, and then I see a problem there. Excellent. Uh, I, I, I'm getting already some questions from, uh, from the audience, um, uh, and I'll be very happy to open the floor to, to questions. However, uh, I have one more of my own that, uh, that I wanted to ask, and I was uh, following this issue quite closely, so, so I'm very interested in your answers. I wanted to ask about the, the global uh, minimum corporate uh, tax that has been agreed at the OECD and uh, G20 level um, that is supposed to uh, <clears throat> level out the playing field a little bit at least for for companies. Um, uh, and this is a question for Fl Mr. Flamand because uh, he, he has been uh, uh, talking about the uh, the competition in personal tax, uh, which which you I think estimated at four and a half billion uh, euros, that could be could be um, retrieved from if, if basically these tax schemes were uh, eliminated, and and yet there is uh, the the there is no there seems to be no estimate of how much money we could get as uh, um, as the, the European Union as a whole if. Uh, all, all countries played by the rules and all introduced the minimum tax for for corporations. Uh, how would you address this? Uh, yeah, thanks. So th th there are two parts. So first, at an aggregate level, there are some estimations. I mean, I think my dear colleagues from the observatory that, that have estimated in a former report uh, this kind of issue. So for a fifty percent uh, for a fifty percent scenario under pillar two, uh, they estimate that the gain for the EU as a whole uh, would be eighty three point three billion euros uh, in the case without carve outs, and in the worst scenario with carve outs, so meaning all the deductions that are granted in case you have some assets or some employees in the country, uh, the worst scenario gives a, an estimation of 63.9 billion euros for the EU as a well. whole. So at an aggregate level, there are some significant, significant gains that could be raised uh, from this 15% uh, uh, agreement. Uh, there was also the, the issue of uh, winners and losers inside the EU. Uh, will they, there, there be like uh, countries that will win and countries that will lose? So basically, if, if they are winning winners and losers, it, it can come from two, two things. So first, uh, that could be from the pillar one uh, that is reallocating profits. And so uh, that could change uh, between countries, the, 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 the revenue that, that could be raised. And that could also come from uh, the fact that the headquarters could change their domicile uh, in response to the pillar one and pillar two uh, uh, agreement. So uh, for the for the pillar one uh, the pillar one uh, uh, for the pillar one argument. So basically, a basic reminder is that to uh, to to be under the pillar one uh, decision, you have to have a turnover above uh, twenty billion euros and profitability uh, above ten percent. So basically, this is going to target uh, only a small sample of uh, firms uh, around eighty. And uh, on top of that, you have only 25% of the profit, over 10% of profit that will be reallocated. So basically, in theory, uh, you have a prevalence of pillar one over pillar two. Uh, but in practice, pillar two is going to have a lot more effect. So basically, uh, countries that have headquarters are not going to lose a lot from this reallocation of profits that is coming from pillar one, at least for a lot of uh, firms. Uh, and for the, the kind of behavioral response of multinational firms, our firms are going to move uh, after the agreement. Um, the fact is that uh, in practice, uh, it is not that obvious that there will be a kind of a change of tax of a headquarter domicile uh, because of the carve outs. Uh, the carve outs uh, uh, lead to an effective tax rate that could go. Uh, far beyond the 15%. And so the incentive to locate the headquarter elsewhere is quite limited. 
And so all in all, because of the fact that in practice, pillar one is not that prevalent of pillar two and the fact that uh, there is no really, a, uh, the response of a change of domicile of headquarters is not uh, obvious. Uh, all in all, uh, we it, it could be that there will not be like any losers be, and Netherlands, Luxembourg, Ireland could benefit from the pillar two of the, the agreement. So what is important to keep in mind is that um, at an aggregate level, it's a great gain for the EU, mostly between 60 and 80 billion euros per year of gain thanks to this agreement. Uh, the allocation of profits, it's a huge progress, but basically uh, it's, it's only applying to a few firms, so that will not change a lot uh, between countries at the, at the European level uh, at the beginning. Uh, and uh, the fact that uh, firms are not that in, uh, not a huge incentive to move their headquarters because with carve-outs they, they can they can benefit from a, a rate that can, that can fall uh, below fifteen percent. Thank you. That was very very comprehensive, and uh, uh, thanks for the numbers. Uh, I'll be happy to use them as a journalist in, in the future. Uh, Mr. Tang, are you um, uh, as a as a Dutch? Uh, representative in, in line with uh, Mr. Flamau? Or? Uh, aligned, well, I'm, I'm, I'm Dutch, but I'm sort of fighting the, the Dutch position as a, as a tax haven, right? So that's, um, that's also Dutch. And I very much hope that this will um, put further pressure on the tax havens outside the EU, but also inside the EU. We have quite a number of countries that are hubs in the, the industry of uh, tax avoidance, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Ireland. And the mess, uh, and I hope for very much that these measures are the minimum effective tax rate is indeed effective in curbing, uh, curbing tax avoidance. Um, that would be, but we, I, it's pretty sure that it does, a fight against tax avoidance uh, that doesn't stop here, right? Um, to start with, uh, I think there are, uh, and I mentioned that the carve out, pushing it the effective tax rate below 15. I think we 15% is uh, is a bare minimum to, to start with. Uh, we need more um, equal treatment of capital income and labor income. And if you think about that, that means we're still a long way from, uh, from that. So we need a, a BEPS 3. In fact, we need a new round of international negotiations. Uh, besides, the scope of the agreement is such that it applies mainly to large corporates, but tax avoidance also uh, occurs uh, at the level of, of a person or the smaller corporates. So look at the shell. That's why it's, for example, to tackle, important to tackle the shell companies, uh, important vehicle which uh, usually don't have the substance. Uh, and what we want to do with the tax avoid fight against tax avoidance is indeed try to make sure that we, that we reduced all the paper investments, uh, the IMF calls that phantom investment, that are just aimed to reduce uh, the tax bill and um, leaving us with the real investment. But that, that is still the fight that, need, that needs to continue. And uh, like I said, this is an, uh, the international agreement has been impressive. We didn't think it was possible a year ago, let alone five years ago. Uh, but now it's there. I very much hope to uh, to have a next round. Excellent. And uh, Mr. Ferber? Yeah, thank you very much. And I couldn't agree more what has been read, uh, already been said by Eloy, uh, because it really shows the problems. On the one hand, of course, the OECD agreement is a good step in the right direction on international level, but it does not address the issues we have in a single market. So therefore, we have to further develop uh, things uh, inside the European Union, because uh, I don't think that the 15% is now uh, a big issue for Ireland, which has to increase its corporate tax from 12.5 to 15, or in the Netherlands or, or Luxembourg, as that was not the challenge. Yeah, um, The problem is uh, that it has never been uh, the reality that the companies had to pay these taxes, and, and that is what we have to address. Um, I will not blame uh, parties and things because it makes no sense. <laughs> I have the feeling that in some member states it's really an issue of national understanding uh, which, and that thinking has to be changed. 
The biggest problem is now whether the statutory tax rate in any member state, um, no, it's not the problem whether the statutory tax rate is 20, 25, or as in Germany, even above 30%, but whether multinationals actually have to pay the tax rate. And to be very clear, the study the tax observatory has conducted made that very clear. Nowadays, it is less about the rates and more about the special regimes that only a select a few, uh, uh, which can only a few uh, enjoy. And that is what we have to address additionally inside the European Union, as you have never such kind of distortion between Europe and United States or name other OECD countries. But in, in a single market where you have free movement of goods, free movement of workers, free movement of capital, of course, these things matter. And therefore, I fully support what has been said. And I'm very happy to have this study now in the hand, really to show what is needed additionally on a European level. So OECD is good for international, but for the single market, especially on pillar two, we have to find European solutions. Thank you. That's. Uh... Uh, that's very clear, and, uh, and frankly, since we're talking about really big money uh, every year, the, there is an incentive to do something about it. However, just uh, one more uh, follow-up before we move on to the questions from the floor. Given that taxes are a national uh, prerogative in the EU, what are the chances, and this is a question for both members of parliament, uh, what are the chances that actually we could have uh, any EU uh, EU consensus on it, what to do, how, how to not allow uh, uh, big corporates to get away without paying big taxes. Uh, maybe, uh, Mr. Ferbeck. Uh, yeah, uh, I will do it very shortly because that is the mother of our questions. As long as we have anonymous decisions, everyone can block everything. Yeah, and that is uh, one of the main challenges. But this uh, policy of uh, uh, digger in the garden of the neighbor <laughs> with tax incentives is not a fair way of competition. And that's why I think the key element would be that we get rid of unanimous decisions in the question, not in the rates, but in the question how to organize taxes. The rates, that is really something for the member states. But as I said, whether Ireland has 15 or 20% uh, as a corporate tax, as long as companies have not to pay this rate, <laughs> the rate is unnecessary. Therefore, uh, for creating a level playing field, we should come to qualified majority. And that is something we want to bring up, I think together with a lot of political groups in the European Parliament to the Conference for the Future of, of the Future of Europe as our demand, because uh, this kind of disruption of the single markets can't be accepted anymore in the 21st century. Mr. Tain, you agree? Yeah, I agree, of course, uh, on this. Uh, would be good if we have majority uh, decision-making and have European initiatives. I'm still, and I, Marcus Ferb and I indeed worked on uh, the European corporate tax system, and I'm still very much in favor of the apportionment formula. I think that's a further reform that is uh, doable and uh, or making the, the system robust and simple and fair. Um, so we keep on the, that fight. At the same time, um, I also see um, that it helps to exert pressure on individual member states. Let's identify the problem, put pressure on that. And uh, I've been pushing on this, uh, this matter of tax avoidance uh, and the tax havens in my own country for, for many years. And I think, let's not be pessimistic. I think the Netherlands might turn around here. So change it's, uh, because there you'll see that also the employer organization realized that all the constructions, all the shell companies in, uh, in the Netherlands will hurt the reputation uh, of the Netherlands and doesn't do any good for real business. And that's interesting because uh, let's, uh, so I was looking forward to, the, to a new government that takes even more time than in Germany or much more time than in Germany. Um, but still awaiting this agreement, see what's in there that shows that indeed there will be a, a sea change in, in Dutch policy, because then it would be the first country to change course. And if the Netherlands can, why not Luxembourg and Ireland? 
Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, indeed, we are. I, I think with the Dutch government creation, we are slowly coming closer to the Belgian record. Um, <clears throat> uh,